So today we've been looking at hydrocarbons and crude oil as a mixture of hydrocarbons and looking at how we can separate crude oil into each of the different fractions of hydrocarbon fuel that it contains. So as a little bit of a recap, we um, looked firstly at what the word hydrocarbon means and decided that a hydrocarbon is a molecule that has a carbon backbone and hydrogen atoms bonded to it. We decided that the family of, uh, of hydrocarbons that we'd look at today would be alkanes, and this makes up the majority of crude oil, which we find as one of the fossil fuels. Really, really useful because we can break it down into all sorts of different fuels. And we had a look at that, which we'll come to in a few minutes' time. Um, we started with the most basic. We looked at uh, methane, and you guys got a little model of methane and a little carbon atom out. Where are they? Okay, so you took one molecule um, of methane, we constructed it by taking a single atom of carbon. We looked at the periodic table and found that carbon is actually in group four. Um, the information on the periodic table is 612, so it means we've got six electrons, and that means two in the first shell, four in the second shell. So carbon's not very happy, it's got four electrons and it needs eight in the outer valence shell. So what it does is it covalences, it, it shares outer electrons with other elements. And hydrogen is one that is around when fossil fuels are made. So the carbon and hydrogen bond together, hydrogen being group one, if you like when you look at the periodic table, it's got one electron in the outside um, and only electron shell. What hydrogen is doing is this little spot is donating its electron to the carbon atom and another hydrogen comes along, donates its electron in exchange for one of the electrons from the carbon and four in total. Four hydrogen atoms are needed in order to make a full outer shell for carbon. So we can just count now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Carbon's now happy. It's got a full outer shell. Each one of these hydrogens has only got one electron shell anyway, so that's happy too. That's a bit of a long-winded way of drawing it when actually for this part we can simplify it to this as a structural diagram um, of methane. We decided methane, group one, has this formula. Um, if you can't remember what the CnH2n plus 2 means, then basically the number of carbons we're going to call n, in this case is 1, got one carbon atom there. The number of hydrogens in any alkane molecule is twice the number of carbons plus two. So it's twice the number of carbon atoms plus two. When we start to look over here at ethane, you can see why that is. If you've got two carbons, which is what the eth part means, then you've got one hydrogen along the top row for each carbon, one hydrogen along the bottom row for each carbon, plus there's always an extra hydrogen on each end. So it's two lots of the number of carbons for row one and row two, then you two on the end, and you've got yourself a formula. Don't forget when we're doing this, you've got to count the number of bonds that carbon is making. It's in group four. It's going to make one, two, three, four bonds. One of them is connecting it to a carbon atom, and this carbon atom here has one, two, three, four bonds, so all four of these uh, electrons in its outer shell are being used. So that's really what alkanes are. As a definition, you want to be making sure that you say that hydrocarbons have single carbon carbon bonds, and therefore every possible bond in the molecule that is not connecting carbon to carbon can be saturated with hydrogen. Hydrogen atoms, as many as you can possibly fit on there. 
As soon as you see a molecule that's got a double carbon carbon bond, it's not saturated because that could actually ping open and add more hydrogen in it. It's not a saturated molecule. That would be an alkene, which we're not going to cover today. Propane, again, the ane part here, meaning part of the alkane family, with three carbons and butane, four carbons. So these are the two gases that you're going to find coming out the gas taps or going into your boiler at home um, or being used in patio gas uh, for your barbecue. All fuels, all really, really useful, and all fossil fuels at that. We now look at separating out a mixture, so we're going to head over to the practical. So this distillation demonstration shows us how we can actually separate a mixture like crude oil. First thing we're going to do is it gets up to temperature, is turn on the tap, which is going to push water up through our condenser. So we've got a Liebig condenser in here, and the idea is to keep that nice and cool. So any gas particles that come down the tube, let's just take a quick look, there we go, just filling up with water and the water coming back out down here, should be nice and cool in there. Any gas particles coming from here, there's hydrocarbons coming up and staying as a gas, even at the top of the column, going to come down into our condenser and turn back into a liquid, and that should run out at the end that we can collect our fraction um, in this boiling tube here. So the fractionating column, or the distillation column, is simply a glass tube with lots of high surface area projection sticking in. And the idea is that it's going to be hottest at the bottom, it's going to get cooler as you go up. You might be able to see some of the um, condensation happening in here, little clouds of um, the gas just turning back into liquid droplets and then falling back down here as a liquid. Now this has been running throughout the lesson today, so we've already taken two or three fractions from this mixture. Um, the first fraction were the smallest molecules, the lightest ones. We thought about them as like maggots, maggots in a bucket. If you go fishing and you want to get your maggots out of the bucket, it's easy to pull those apart. Um, they're not so tangled up together. Um, if you take worms and use those small worms, it's going to be a little bit more tricky to separate. And we thought that after our maggots had been removed and they'd been condensed back down here, those tiny molecules, our first fraction, um, then the temperature would have to go up for the second fraction. So at the thermometer up the top here, we'd have to bring the temperature of the system up and those longer molecules would then be able to make it up to the top before they condense. And at that point, they can then run down our condenser, turn back into a liquid, and we can collect our next fraction. And again, the same thing happens again. Bring the temperature back up at the bottom. It brings the temperature of the whole system right up. And the temperature at the top here, the crucial part where those gaseous hydrocarbons can then make it down the condenser and... Um, we collect our next fraction. So um, we've got a few fractions that we took from today. So we've got the first, which was a very runny, very low viscosity, not very gloopy um, hydrocarbon mixture to start with. And then a slightly gloopier um, mixture second. At the moment we've got, I don't know if you can see here, a slightly yellower looking fraction coming out. Very slowly, but it is coming out. Um, as we burnt those in the lesson, we found that the first less viscous, smaller hydrocarbon um, fraction burnt very, very quickly. In fact, the splint didn't even need to touch the fuel um, for it to set on fire. And it burnt with a relatively clean flame. The second fraction, a little bit bigger, those hydrocarbons, a little bit longer, a bit gloopier, like the small worms rather than the maggots they weren't able to evaporate as well at room temperature, so we had to actually touch the, um, the, the, the fuel here, that fraction, with the lit splint for it to set on fire. Um, the third fraction, even harder um, to set on fire. We had to almost use the splint as a wick, um, so it then burnt with a very, very smoky flame. Um, and that's really sort of it's becoming yellower, darker, it's becoming smokier, that flame. And those particles are longer and longer. The longer we leave this on, the higher temperature, most importantly, that we take this to, the bigger those hydrocarbons that come out. And it's the same principle when we split crude oil using a fractionating column, which is coming up next. So back to the fractionating column. This is done on a much bigger scale than we've just seen. 
We've got a little methane molecule here with its hydrogen atoms now attached. And these little molecules here, along with the bigger ones, are going to come into the fractionating column at over 350 degrees C. And every single hydrocarbon there is going to be coming in as a gas. Now, immediately, the temperature drops ever so slightly, and the, the really long, thick, gloopy, viscous hydrocarbons, they condense and are collected at the bottom here as bitumen, which is used to make tar for roads. The rest of these molecules are so hot, they all stay as a gas, completely separated from each other, and they're able to pass up through these tiny little um, gaps. They're actually little caps, which are one-way valves. The gas is passed through. Now, it goes to a slightly lower temperature layer, and that's designed to allow most of the chemicals, most of these hydrocarbons, to remain as a gas and continue to rise up through the column. Each layer becomes lower and lower in temperature, and at each layer, the biggest, longest, most viscous hydrocarbons actually get to condense and get collected at each of these layers. So above the bitumen, you then have your heavy fuel oil used for ships, for fuel and ships. Then you've got motor oil and your lubricating oils. We then get to areas like this where you've got um, diesel, we've got kerosene, we've got um, petrol further up here. These are only about eight or so carbon atoms long, so we would call that uh, oct A, the oct meaning eight. And then right at the top, these gases would not condense um, right the way up to the top, some of the smaller um, molecules. So they would be bottled as a gas. And that really is how our fractional distillation works. Um, some of the key points are up here, so I hope that's been of help.